On behalf of the Badminton Pan American Confederation, we warmly welcome you to our Coach Corner program. My name is Richard Wong, and it's my honor once again to be today's moderator. For Spanish and French speaking community, please look for the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screens. We recommend that you use headphones and mute the original audio for better sound quality. If you have any questions or comments, we invite you to write them down in the chat box located on the right side of your screens. Questions will be answered at the end of the session. We have reached the end of the fifth session and before introducing today's lecturers, we will link up in Kingston, Jamaica with, where Mr. Vishit Tolan, president of Badminton Panam, awaits us. Mr. Tolan. Thank you, Richard. Smashing fast. All our badminton games, when we go to watch the matches, one of the things that's most profound to us is to see smashes being executed by the players. It's usually a wonderful sight. Dear friends, today we close the fifth season of the Coach Corner program, in which we have been able to have another 12 new episodes. In this season, Chema, and Ram gave us in detail their experience as coaches during an Olympic Games, while Maitain taught us the route to reach Paris 2024. Pi Hong Yang told us the particularities of the European and Asian badminton schools that were complemented by the results of the eight weeks plyometric training by Professor Felder. We got a first-hand information about the Center of Excellence located in Denmark by Jerome and Jacob. Our Special Olympic friends, along with John, Maggie, Armando, and Edgar, offered us a great talk about how badminton becomes a vehicle for equality and inclusion. Dr. Smith encouraged us to train motivation and resilience in our young players, while Adrian and Daniel showed us the basics of research applied to badminton. William, Wheeler, and Martin showed us how technology allows us to go further and get better results. Last but not least, our friends from the Loughborough University, who will come in a minute, will let us know about what science says about our smashes, the badminton smashes. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you, Panam team. Thanks to our translators, Marion and Bruno, to our moderators, Adrian and Richard, of course. And to all of you friends that with your presence, Tuesday to Tuesday, have allowed us to travel all this way and leave you as a legacy, a very useful tool and resourceful collection of webinars that you can all review on our YouTube channel in both English, Spanish, or French. Therefore, after this webinar, I officially announce the end of the fifth season. Can you imagine? We have now completed five seasons of Panam Coaches Corner. Please stay tuned since we will return on the 2nd of November with more webinars. Thank you all. Richard, let's continue. Over to you. Thank you, Mr. Tolan. Now, in today's session, we are pleased to have some of the most outstanding researchers in our sport. Allow me to introduce Dr. Mark King, Mr. Harley Taula from the UK, and Mr. Stefan Gutskanov from Bulgaria, who today will talk to us about this important topic, smashing fast, what the science says. Before handing over to our guests, allow me to tell you a little about them. Dr. Mark King, he's a former chair of the International Society of Biomechanics Technical Group on Computer Simulation. He's also an Associate Dean for Enterprise and Professor in the School of Sport, Exercise and Health Sciences at Loughborough University. Recently, he has been awarded the position of Fellow of the International Society of Biomechanics and Sports. Our other guest, Mr. Harry Towler, he's a former Great Britain player, attaining a world rank of number 41 
a Great Britain rank of number two in men's doubles, with wins at the French and Welsh International Challenge over Fu Haifeng and Zhu Chen from China. He also has a PhD, he is also a PhD student in the School of Sport, Exercise and Health Sciences and the Sports Technology Institute at Loughborough University. His research focuses on how the racket and technique influence the performance of the badminton smash. Our third guest, Mr. Stefan Lutzkanov, is, uh, he was a former full-time player and um, professional badminton coach. He's a visiting fellow in the high performance coaching, technology and entrepreneurship at Loughborough University. He's a PhD student in the School of Sports, Exercise and Health Sciences, Sciences and also the business school investigating multi-layer profiling, development and business model for badminton. Good afternoon, my friends, and welcome to our program. Thank you for accompanying our audience and receiving us from your homes in Loughborough. We invite you to take control and share your screen. Uh, thank you, Richard, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, while Harley's just getting the screen up. Um, now, this presentation will build on what we uh, presented just over a year ago when I talked about optimum performance in the jump smash. Since then, we've been continuing to do the science and the research, and um, Harley is just coming towards the end of his studies, um, so he will show us the latest findings. And then Stefan, being a pro former professional coach and also a PhD student, is at the start of his journey, and uh, he will be there to help, help answer questions at the end. So I'll hand over to Harley. Okay, thanks, Mark. Okay, and thanks for the introduction. So the presentation today, uh, like we've said, uh, smashing fast, uh, what the science says. Okay, and that's um, Stefan, Mark and myself uh, will answer some questions uh, later on. Okay, so quickly as my background, so a former GB badminton player. Um, again, kind of have my rankings and results um, already. Uh, currently a PhD student at Loughborough uh, within the School of Sport, Exercise and Health Sciences. So I'm looking at the influence of racket and technique on performance of the badminton smash. So that includes characterizing uh, the racket. So here, looking how the racket vibrates. Secondly, looking at accurately quantifying technique during the smash. So having a clear understanding of what's happening uh, within the body during the movement. And then looking at how they both affect the performance of the smash. So both the racket and the technique. And then my research interests, so again, related to my PhD, uh, relating technique and performance, uh, the application of science within sport. So again, especially recently with the abundance of data, looking at how we can use that to understand, improve and optimize performance. And then finally, the human equipment interaction in sports performance. So today's presentation, uh, I'll be looking at how we can break down the smash uh, with respect to the motions of the joints. So looking at which joint motions are important and also the timing uh, and sequencing of those joint motions in terms of rack head speed development. Uh, additionally, looking at collating all the relevant scientific literature related to the smash and provide some new results on top of what Mark presented uh, last year from a larger data set. So while the smash, when we watch uh, Lee Chung Wei here uh, performing this winning smash, now we want to understand what is he doing in that very fast, rapid motion, you know, so that he can perform that smash at near 400 kilometers per hour. Okay. So the smash is the physically most demanding shot in badminton in the Rio Olympic Games in the men's singles. Players hit on average over 100 smashes per match. It's obviously an aggressive stroke used to win points, which is the ultimate uh, goal uh, within an, a match. And it's the last shot played in 29% of the rallies within men's singles. So a large proportion of those points are won by the smash. And of course, everybody wants to be able to smash faster. So here's a simple model of how we can maybe look at smash success. So these first three, Thinking about the trajectory and landing location. So how can apply movement pressure to our opponent? Uh, this last one, shuttlecock speed, 
more of a time pressure to make them move faster. The central one, spatiotemporal information, is essentially the information we provide spatially and from a time perspective to our opponent and how they can anticipate or find it difficult to anticipate our shot. Next, we can kind of look at what happens around contact and influence those first three. So we've got the shuttle angle horizontally and vertically as, as it leaves the racket, the height uh, of contact, which obviously allows us to hit a steeper smash. We can then think about things like the impact location, racket head speed and the racket properties, all which relate to uh, the outgoing shuttlecock speed. And then lastly, kind of more technique related and building up towards the point of impact, what we do with our body and movement and how we orientate the racket at impact. Okay, so overall, this is quite a simple model of smash performance. And actually a lot of these factors interrelate. So if we think about racket property to start with, they're gonna have a large um, effect on how we can move and what technique we can use. So if we've got a really heavy racket, we're not gonna be able to rotate our joints at the same speed. Similarly, if we use a really heavy racket, we're not gonna be able to achieve the same racket head speed. Next, we think about shuttlecock speed. Now, if we hit a slower smash, the shuttle is gonna fall to the floor closer to the net on the opponent's side of the court, so not travel through the court as much. Then we can also think about how our technique and movement influence what our player can visually see. So how obvious is it that we're gonna play a smash and how obvious you know, the direction we might be hitting the stroke. And then finally, how we strength and maybe size influence all of this. We're obviously a taller player, you know, it's got longer levers, can hit the shuttle at a higher point and generate a steeper smash. So overall, it's quite a complex system of how we might define smash success. And today we're going to focus on how the technique and the movement influence racket head speed, shuttlecock speed, and then ultimately the smash success. So how we collect our data. So at Loughborough, we've got data on over 100 badminton players, primarily male. So most at an elite international level, some more national and regional level. So a lot of this data was collected at the All England Championships and World Championships, uh, and some at the National Centre here in England. Uh, we collect our data using motion capture. For, so for those who aren't, Familiar, we've got a lot of cameras, so 18 here around the player, some of which you can't see. And what those cameras can do is track retro reflective markers applied to the body and racket, as well as tape on the racket and the shuttle. And we typically got players to perform 30 smashes and they're instructed to smash as fast as possible. So with that data, we then get an image or video of what the camera can see. So all those retro reflected markers. From that, we can build a model of the body and then a skeleton, and then understand what is happening at the joints. And in terms of the outputs we're interested in, so we're looking at the joint angles, so segments, um, orientation and relative to the adjacent segment, and then also the joint angular velocities. So how fast are those rotations happening? Then in terms of the technique variables I'll be discussing today, that will only be the male players. So 82 participants. So predominantly all of those players were using what we would refer to as a two footed jump smash. And the variables we'll be looking at. So racket head speed at impact, how that influences smash speed, the impact location. So where on the shuttle, um, the, we're on the rack at the shuttle hit, sorry. The joint angles and then the angular velocities and how they contribute to the angulares de las articulaciones y las contribuciones hacia eh, la velocidad de la raqueta. Okay. So the first result we'll look at uh, racket head speed. So, like I said, we're interested here in the racket head speed at impact, and this is relative to the string bed. So coming directly out of the string bed, how fast is that racket moving? 
So unsurprisingly, rack head speed is the strongest predictor of shuttlecock speed. As you can see here, very strong relationship from about 37, 38 meters per second, all the way up to around 75 meters per second. And again, that's ranging from 200 or approximately 200 to 400 kilometers per hour in the smash. So we do get a slight imperfect uh, relationship here. That's primarily due to racket properties. So again, if we've got a heavier racket, generally that's gonna be, uh, have more momentum in the system. And then similarly with impact location, um, that's going to affect how much momentum is transferred to the shuttle. And then finally, we've got the direction of the racket velocity. So if, if we're hitting directly through the shuttle or maybe slicing across it, is also going to influence the outgoing shuttle clock speed. Next, we've got impact location. So this is from a study uh, last year that we published. So looking at the effects of impact location on shuttle clock speed. So for different percentiles of a participant's maximum speed, we get a cluster of where their impact locations were. And when you see as the percentage goes down and down, we get a much larger spread of that, uh, those impact locations. And what we can do with all that data is generate a heat map. So comparing our two impact locations, so across the racket face and up and down, and relating that back to shuttlecock speed um, relative to the player's maximum. And impact location alone can explain as much as 75% of the variance in shuttlecock speed. Okay, and that's when we've got control where every player is using the same racket. And we generally find that the optimal location here is uh, just above the racket head center and slightly medial. So that's closer to if the player was st stood somewhere here, yeah, that's this side of the racket closer to their body. And that's the case because we think about the racket moving, the tip is gonna be moving much quicker than the throat. So any impact location higher up the racket will be moving quicker. And similarly, the racket rotating or twisting this side of the racket will be moving much quicker than the other side. So again, it kind of emphasizes the importance of being able to consistently uh, have a, an accurate impact location close to that optimal. So the first kind of technique uh, variable we'll look at is body positioning. So we generally found at the body's lowest center of mass position. So this is generally just before a player is about to jump those players who position further behind the shuttle relative to where they make contact produced a greater smash speed. And in the literature, it generally recommended that players are positioned around half a meter behind the shuttle relative to where they finish when they make contact. And that allows an improvement in shuttlecock speed and the angle. And why this is important, so if we place further behind the shuttle, we can produce a larger range of motion uh, in the joints at the arm, so especially the shoulder. And also as a small increase in the velocity of the, of the body within the direction of the smash. So we're moving in uh, towards the shuttle and the direction we're hitting. And then looking at jump height. So within our data, we found that generally players who jumped higher tended to produce uh, greater smash speeds. And we think that's just generally a characteristics of better players who are stronger, more athletic and able to jump higher. And that jump is used as a tactical advantage so that they can smash steeper. Okay, but we didn't compare uh, smash, uh, jump smash versus no jump. Uh, within the literature, there has been some studies that have done that. Uh, one paper, so this one here, looks at a group of six Indonesian badminton players uh, within their national uh, setup. Uh, I think they found that four out of the six players produce faster smashes when jumping versus not jumping. And then contrastingly, uh, data set with international Polish players 
found there was no difference between jumping versus no jump conditions. So the kind of conclusion there would be it's unclear whether the jumping actually causes the greater smash speed, but it certainly allows a player to generate a steeper smash, which like we looked at earlier, can apply more pressure to an opposing player or pair. And then the first technique variable we're going to look at is what happens at the trunk. So here we've defined the trunk um, angles as the rotation of the upper torso relative to the lower torso. So imagine separating the upper body into two sections, how the upper part is rotating relative to the lower part. And at the trunk, we've got uh, three rotations that can occur. So we've got flexion and extension, so kind of forwards and backwards. We've got lateral flexion to both sides and then axial rotation, which sometimes called twist or X factor. And it's this third one that we found to be uh, very important for smashing. So here we've got a typical, typical trial. So this is me smashing. Uh, so zero to 100% here is what we've defined as a swing phase. So this is already when the player is in the air and jumped and at the point of which they start to take the racket back. And we've done this normalization to allow a fair comparison between players. Okay, and what we see with the trunk axial rotation here is that we have a large counter rotation up at this point. And here we see the hips start to come forward whilst the trunk stays back. So here in my trial, uh, almost 45 degrees of separation between the upper torso and lower torso. And then as we come through to contact, we've then got that forwards rotation just past neutral as we get to contact. Okay, so that counter rotation through to a rapid uh, forwards rotation. And then what, what we can do is collate all of our data for our 82 male players and look at what's important and when within the swing around this joint rotation. So I just quickly explain this graph. So on the left, we've got the solid blue line here is the mean for all the players. And then the shaded area is a standard deviation. So the variability across the players. Then the graph on the right, any shaded area means that there was a significant correlation between the angle and smash speed. And if the shaded area is below this red line, that means a negative angle was beneficial and above the red line, a more positive angle was beneficial. So what we can see here with axial rotation, around the first 70% of the swing phase, those who are more counter rotated produce a greater smash speed. And we can see they achieve a similar position at contact, tendency to be more uh, forwards rotated but again, that wasn't significant. Okay. And what this essentially means is that the players who smashed fastest had a much greater range of motion of this axial rotation of the trunk, and that allows them to generate a greater angular velocity, which we also found was correlated with smash speed. So moving on to the shoulder. So this is the upper arm rotating relative to the upper torso. And again, we've got three rotations that can happen. So firstly, plane of elevation. So if we picture this from looking uh, down at a person, so this is how far forwards the arm is relative to the torso. So if the arm's perfectly out to the side, the angle would be zero. As we move it forward, it becomes positive. As we move it backwards, it becomes negative. Similarly with elevation and depression, so this is our view from the side looking at how high the arm is. And if it's down by our side, we've got zero degrees. As we bring it all the way up to vertical, we've got 180 degrees. And then finally, internal external rotation. So this is axial rotation uh, of the upper arm. So essentially twisting, okay? So thinking about this figure here, um, bringing the forearm up and down would be external rotation and internal rotation. So the first rotation we found that was important here was the plane of elevation. So again, how far forwards or backwards the arm is relative to the torso. 
So I can see here at the start of the swing phase, the arm's already quite far back relative to the torso. And then comes just past neutral um, around the start of the forward swing. And again, just past neutral as we get to contact. Okay, but it's a general progression from being further behind the torso to just past as we get to contact. And what we found here, so again, a very similar graph before, mean and standard deviation, and then where we found significant correlation to smash speed. So the players who had their arm further back for the first 80% of the swing produced greater shuttlecock speeds. Okay. And again, it's that delayed forward movement of the arm. And we see this a lot in baseball pitching as well, where again, the aim is to produce very high ball speeds in the baseball pitch. So you can see in this image here, the trunk's already started to rotate forward, but the arm is held very far back. Okay. And essentially what this means is that by holding the arm back, we get a large stretching of the muscles across the chest and that allows an enhanced forward contraction and a stronger movement when we eventually pull the arm forwards. The next rotation of the shoulder is internal and external rotation. So again, for this same trial, we see a gradual external rotation up until about 85, 90% 90, 90 of the swing phase followed by a rapid internal rotation through to contact and coming back to roughly the same position that we started in. And again, when we collate all the data for our 82 participants, what we find is around the end of the backswing, the players who had a more externally rotated position were able to produce uh, greater smash speeds. And similar to the axial rotation, that means we can complete a larger range of motion and develop a greater angular velocity of that rotation. So one of our previous papers last year actually found that the a more internally rotated position of contact was what differentiated between faster and slower smashes. Uh, again, here we found that the actual counter rotated position was what was more important. But essentially both hypotheses there are that a more or a greater range of motion of internal rotation is what's important. So again, greater range of motion leading to greater angular velocity. Then at the elbow and wrist, within our larger data set, we found that none of the joint angles were uh, correlated with just a cock speed. So that's both flexion extension and pronation and supination at the elbow and flexion extension and radial and ulnar deviation at the wrist. Uh, a previous paper with some uh, elite Malaysian badminton players found that a more flexed elbow uh, at contact allowed a greater uh, shutter cock speed to be produced. Still relatively extended, um, but again, not full extension. And while this might be important, with a more flexed elbow, generally the shoulder is in a better position to produce higher internal rotation angular velocities. Okay, and it's important here, the elbow and wrist are still important motion uh, joints in terms of developing rack head speed, which we'll come on to a little bit later. I just wanna quickly talk around forearm rotation. So within badminton coaching, it's quite common for coaches to use forearm rotation, particularly when describing elbow or radio ulna pronation, supination. So elbow motion describes the motion of the forearm relative to the upper arm. So it's independent of what the shoulder is doing. So actually when if you think about my arm here, I can cause the forearm to rotate by just internally rotating the shoulder as well as keeping that fixed and also just rotating at the elbow. So the kind of main point here is that the term forearm rotation isn't wrong, but it's important to understand what's causing the forearm to rotate, whether it's the shoulder or the elbow or a combination of the two. And again, when coaching players, it's important for them to know, like I said, which of those joint motions is causing that rotation. 
So now to look at like, how we develop rack head speed. So we've looked at what angles are important, but now I want to look at the sequence and initiation of how that head speed is developed. Okay, so if you look at this typical trace of racket head speed, then yeah, we've got general as during the backswing, a kind of slow buildup of speed before around this 80% point, which is when we start to bring the racket forward. We get a very rapid acceleration of the racket up until contact. And within our data set, generally the rack head speeds are in the high 50 meters per second, as I showed in the figure earlier. That can be anywhere from 40 to 75 meters per second, depending on the level of the player. So when trying to understand these high velocity motions, it can help to understand what sequence of joint rotations um, occur that cause this development of rack head speed. So I want you to spend a minute or two to think how and when this racket head speed is developed based on the peak joint rotation velocities. Okay, and that's based on the rotations of the four joints I've discussed so far. So the trunk, shoulder, elbow and wrist. And have a think, do you think the smash motion and technique follows a proximal to distal sequence? So that's starting from the trunk through to the wrist, or do you think you know, it's slightly uh, or not strictly a proximal to distal sequence? Okay. So as a quick break, um, I said, have a think around what you think is the sequence of joint rotations based on the peak uh, speeds um, that cause the development of rack ahead speed. So again, we've got this trace of rack ahead speed development. And I said a gradual increase before the start of the forward swing where we get that rapid acceleration. So we can think about this development of rack head speed at any given time as uh, being represented by the sum of all the different contributions of the joints within the body system. Okay, and that's a trunk, shoulder, elbow and wrist. Okay, and what we find in terms of the sequencing of movements is that the first uh, peak comes from shoulder external rotation. So taking the racket backwards during the backswing. And then similarly, the wrist extending. So you know, relatively small contributions here from both of those rotations. And then just before the start of the forward swing, so thinking here around 80% um, is around the uh, transition from backswing to forward swing. We get the trunk starting to rotate forwards. And then just after the start of the forward swing, we get a very large contribution uh, from elbow extension before that um, going close to zero near contact, or racket shuttle contact. Uh, then we get a very small contribution from the wrist, ulna deviation. So that's this movement here. So we think about when we smash, that's a movement of the wrist in this direction. Then the biggest contributor is shoulder internal rotation. So that's his very large peak here. And at this time point, that's explaining almost all of the rack head speed. Um, like I said, around 90 to 95% of the um, total rack head speed. Then following that, we get a um, small contribution from trunk flexion. So that's the forwards rotation I mentioned earlier. And we actually found that's a very important differentiator between um, players who can smash fast and those who can't are the contributions and rotational speeds of both trunk flexion and the axle rotation I mentioned earlier. Then we get quite a large contribution from wrist flexion and that's just prior to impact. And then finally we get at contact a kind of moderate contribution from elbow pronation. So that's quite a small contribution to what people may think you would get from pronation. And we think that pronation, rather than being a major contributor to speed or rack head speed, it's actually more important in terms of getting the racket face in the correct uh, position at contact. And then also at contact, we get a 
again, moderate contribution from the deflection or kind of elastic behavior of the racket. And as we look at that graph there, if we summed all of those lines up, that would essentially give us our uh, head speed of the racket um, that I showed you earlier, the black line. Okay, so to kind of sum the um, development of rack head speed up, so the shoulder internal rotation angular velocity is the largest contributor and on, on average that's 10 milliseconds prior to impact. Um, again, compared to what people may expect, the elbow pronation is quite a small contributor. And like I said, probably more important in terms of orientating the racket into the correct position so that we get the direction that we want to hit the smash. The wrist, the second largest contributor, and again, that's just prior to impact. And what's important with the wrist contribution here is that it's very unlikely that the musculature around the wrist causes these high velocities. And it's actually the entire sequence of the previous rotations that caused that um, very fast wrist flexion movement. Um, okay. And like I said earlier, the significant uh, contribution by the trunk axial rotation at the onset of the forward swing or just prior to. And again, this, the entire sequence does not strictly follow a proximal to distal sequence. So we see that elbow pronation peaks at contact, which is later than um, the wrist flexion. We get that the shoulder internal rotation happens after elbow extension. Okay. And then finally, the kind of coaching recommendation based on uh, what I presented today. So we've seen that the range of motion of shoulder internal rotation and axial rotation appear to be critical factors that differentiate between faster and slower smashes. And what's important there is it's the counter movements that are causing that um, greater range of motion. Okay, so the players generally all came to achieve a similar position at impact, but it's what they do during that backswing and getting more counter rotation uh, that's important. So we look at this picture here as players, a former um, world record holder for the smash. You can see here the hips are relatively square. We can see that there the trunk you know, is very much counter rotated relative to that lower torso and hips, which means he can complete a very large range of motion during his forward swing. And we've got that additional delayed forward movement of the arm, stretching the muscles of the chest, which allow us to pull the arm forward at a very high speed or a higher speed than if we didn't have that stretch. And kind of a recommendation here in terms of training, it's ensuring that obviously we want the flexibility to achieve those counter rotated positions, but we need to make sure that we can still generate enough rotational speed to get to the same position at contact. And it's likely that that's a very gradual process. Okay, and as I said, it's important that we don't counter ro rotate too much and not achieve um, that position at contact. Then the final um, comment just around this body positioning. So ideally, again, depending on the shot or previous shot played by our opponent, we want to be getting position behind the shuttle and moving forwards into the shot. Okay, and that allows that greater range of motion of the shoulder and a greater forwards uh, linear velocity of the body, having a slightly larger contribution to rack head speed. So if we look at the two images here, we've got the player on the left who's clearly got behind the shuttle, jumping forwards, which means he can have those greater ranges of motion. And the player on the right is clearly kind of falling and jumping back, which probably means that one, his body's body weight's moving back, and also he won't be able to complete a particularly large range of motion at the shoulder and the other arm joints. And here's just some links to uh, an article I wrote, um, which is very, or which sums up a lot of the information uh, that I've presented today. And then also some links to 
our impact location paper and two papers surrounding uh, technique and smash speed. And finally, just want to acknowledge all the different academics and students that have helped with all the uh, badminton research that we've conducted at Loughborough. And if there's any questions, uh, Mark, Stefan and I will be happy to try and answer them. Thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to our question and answer section. Please, if you have any questions or comments you want to share, write them down in the chat box. Okay, so we're gonna wait to see what questions pop up for you guys. That was certainly a lot of information to digest though. You guys really went, uh, took the deep dive into the topic. Yeah, yeah. so hopefully that built upon uh, what Mark presented last year. So I said, we've got a much larger data set that we can now um, get results from. Um, yeah, so yeah, and hopefully I, it's interesting. Yeah. And I guess my challenge to the coaches out there was, would be, does what we've talked about there equate to what you think as coaches or would you you know agree or disagree you know um, and what from your experiences of working with players to improve smash speed Stefan do you have any comments to add uh, yeah <laughs> I guess I have too many comments to add <laughs> uh, I, think, I think it's really fantastic to see what the science can do then if I if I put my head as a coach, uh, I would look at the smash in a lot of different ways and I would look at it from tactical perspective, which I think is very important to understand and you know, find, find out what technique we're going to use properly in the different situation. It's, it's fantastic that the papers uh, really focus on what we'll discuss as a, a total offensive situation where you have all the power you can jump through and all that stuff. But you know, it will be interesting to see the comparison between is this the same technique that stays further forward in different situations? And of course, as a coaches, the biggest question is how do we actually adapt technique? How do we change or teach different technique to our players so they're able to perform similar smash or different different types of smashes in those different tactical situations? This will be, uh, if I put my head as a coach, if I put my head as a researcher, I would definitely like to see that answers in all those aspects, you know, like just to, to do that deep dive and not just one single tactical situation, but go deeper. And I think that's the next step that we're going to take at Lovebra. But it's a, it's a huge research. It's not a simple type of research. Uh, and I, I would say that probably we're a little bit behind of other sports like weightlifting or, you know, swimming and, and things like that. And we also have a lot of strokes. So it's not just one stroke. Mm -hmm. Well, as I said, uh, it, it when you were uh, Harley, when you were going through your presentation, it certainly challenged my concepts as a coach as to how to accomplish a smash. But um, I guess at, at one stage, I was saying, um, "Oh, I've got it wrong." But then you went on to further explain it, and then I was saying, "Okay, well, I'm still on the right track." Um, but anyways, we ha we actually have a question here from Adrian. And he says, what elements should we always consider to develop a strong shot in young players? So I guess what are the key focus points for young players to focus on? Uh, Stefan, do you want to say yeah. that one? Yeah, I, I think I can answer that one. So um, let's say like that, that one of the most important elements that we know has a significant contribution in the and the physical development during especially maturity stage. So when the you know the younger guys have like you know they start growing very aggressively, uh, simply said, is like example mobility and stability of all the trunk. We have to ensure hard over the dimension that that they are capable of going in that range of motion that allows them to smash really well. And what what from my experience as a coach one of the key elements is how strong they are at that range of motion. You know, it's not just I'm able to make everything with my body, but am I strong enough to perform that smash? And typical coach's mistake would be 
then we go and repeat that movement if they're not significantly stronger many, many times. So we're overloading them very early. So a challenge back to all, all the coaches would be, how can we assure that they're mobile enough, stable enough, and then strong enough in the whole range of motion while performing the smash so they can actually become you know, they can become that, uh, they can develop that uh, high speed very securely without overloading or bringing the intensity completely high. Uh, and, and maybe the last one is, is it about a smash speed at the younger players or is it about technique and optimizing the technique? So when they become physically capable, they can turn that in a much greater you know, speed. So as a coach, I want to focus on the power is a young place, but I'll focus on technique and all those elements that I mentioned so I can ensure that they're actually going the right pathway for their consistent, you know, long-term development plan. Mm. Yeah. I mean, yes. I think I think what I, I would add, Richard, is that I think we have a pretty strong idea of what a, a, a good smash technique looks like now. You know, so at the elite end, what, you know, how is that... Um, you know, 400 kilometers an hour achieved or, or more. And um, I think what we're saying is that we're wanting to encourage those sort of shapes and techniques in the younger players. And then as they get stronger, they're able to then generate faster and faster speeds. But it's getting that fundamental timing and shapes right as they're younger is what it feels like. There's still clearly more research to be done on it, but that would be, and that would be true across other sports as well, where say, get the technique and the shapes right and then as you get strong and you physically develop, the speed will come. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, the only thing I add there similar to Mark is with the fast or the players who can achieve the fastest smashes, as well as doing things slightly different. They do it all a lot quicker over a much shorter period of time. So kind of like Stefan's saying, I think it, it's a case of making the techniques correct and over time just making it faster and faster and faster. Or, and as they get stronger, they'll be able to do that. But fundamentally, the technique, I think, should be right to start with. Um, I think I would tend to agree with you guys. Um, you know, on a very similar note, um, I just I had a racket string, and um, I think a lot of the players, a lot of the younger players now are opting for higher tensions, thinking that, you know, it will contribute to a harder smash, right? And I keep telling them, you know, um, I suggest to them rather, that play with a low attention first, get your technique, and then move on from there. Okay. Um, Adrian also has a few more questions. He says, what are the key factors affecting the smash in badminton? If you had to, I guess if you had to isolate a few key factors. Um, okay. Uh, so I think based on my research, the main differentiator is probably the trunk. So when we look at our elite and you know, international players compared to you know, regional level, the amount of or contribution from the trunk is much, much larger in those elite players. Um, and that's kind of where I said in my data, I see the biggest differences, the ability to use the trunk um, as a contributor to rack head speed and shuttlecock speed. Um, Stefan, I've got anything to add. Yeah, and I think that's true in other sports as well. You look at golf where they talk about the X factor in the trunk. You know, you look at cricket fast bowling, which is where we've done a lot of work, and it, the speed comes from the trunk. It doesn't come from the arm. And um, so I think uh, what we're seeing in badminton is common across uh, other sports, throwing projectile-type sports. And you would see the same in a javelin throw as well. So it's not just pulling the arm through, it's bringing the trunk through appropriately and the arm will follow. Yeah, uh, maybe the only thing I would like to add again from coach's perspective is to think is the movement as, as a sequence, as, as what Hardly said is like kinetic, that means join after join after join. That, that speed transfer is very important. So we don't isolate only one movement, but for one join, we're actually making sure that everything works simultaneously together. And of course, that will also affect in all the elements and one of them will contribute more or not. And I'll go again, think about the smash as not just power, you know, think about the contribution of that internal rotation against, you know, that elbow rotation. 
which one it is and what it is. If I'm performing a very steep smash, very nice angle, and I'm very out of balance, I'm going to perform it with my elbow rotation preliminarily compared to if I'm evolving all power where I want to you know, internally rotate more. So it's, again, making this fine balance between seeing the smashes this is the top power two footed jump smash, but it's not the only stroke. We have also, you know, a stick smash. We have different tools around that area, and we have to be able to relate that technique with all those tools. Uh, and then, as coaches, we can contribute more to the adaptation and technique in real time for our players. Okay. All right, uh, Adrian, once again, um, I think you've already addressed this somewhat, but uh, let's see if you come up with a Anything more to add? He asked, do you suggest, apart from a good technique, to develop more speed of the chain of movements to perform increasingly faster shots? So I guess he's saying, uh, apart from the good technique, is he, I guess he's asking if you suggest, you know, um, you work on the speed of it. Yeah, so I think, you know, having the right shapes and ranges of motion um, and then being able to repeat that in a quicker and quicker time frame is the differentiator. So if I compared my smash me, which is nothing like Harley's, the shapes might look the same, but the acceleration of, at the end of the racket head is at a much is slower, so it reaches a, a, a slower top end speed. But the sequencing might look similar, and it may be is that I'm just not as strong as Harley in that able to produce that, you know, that those forces to achieve the accelerations. But the fundamental technique might not look that different. Okay, Mauricio, now uh, Mauricio is asking, what muscles need to be developed the most? I would say that's a very tricky question. You know, <laughs> I would agree I with you. <laughs> yeah, a, it is a really tricky question because, it's, of course, we, we're not talking about just pectoralis or deltoid or some specific group of muscles. We're talking about the whole chain. So uh, as a coach, I would strongly advise to think of, of the whole body as one first before going to a very specific muscle. And what we know, part of my research in that case is, what we're looking is what, where the injury happens and what is actually the factor that injury happens, not only in the smash, but in different situations. And one of the papers that, and unfortunately I can't citate it right now, but one of the papers is talking about reaching that range of motion and then snapping a muscle at that single point there. Why did it happen? You know, the author suggests very clearly that this is because the person is not strong enough or it's went off the range of motion, so it's beyond what he's capable of. So then I'm going back, is it one muscle that we have to fix to fix that move, movement? More likely not. It's a, it's, a, it's a whole group of muscles that we have to think about it. Uh, okay. Yeah. And, um, and what I would say is that the, the next piece of the jigsaw that we're looking at is what are the torques produced at the joints? Um, so maybe we'll come back next time and show you that. And, um, you know, and it's not always obvious. So in a kicking movement or a throwing movement, it can be the muscles that slow down the arm that are just as important as the ones that speed it up. Um, so when you're kicking a ball, it might be your hamstrings that are the weak link. So it's not always as obvious as you think it might be. It's not just the muscles that speed up the movement. It's also the muscles that speed slow the movement down. And understanding what's the limiting factor, I think there's still a bit of research to be done there. Okay. All right. Uh... I think we've reached the end of the, today's webinar. Do you have any final words you'd like to share with the audience? I, I hope you found it interesting and I hope it stimulates some thought and discussion. And uh, this position of using science to help inform coaching is something that we're pushing through BAMIN2, et cetera, with Stefan and Harley. And um, we're really passionate about moving sport forwards uh, through science. And I think that's where we're coming from. Okay. But, 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 uh, I just want to add, if, if all the coaches give us one word what they would expect from scientists, that would be great to have because I, as, a, as, a, as a middle between being a scientist and being the coach, for me, science is always if it can be applied in real life. So what is the most important for all the coaches if they say, oh, this is what we really expect from the science? What would, what would you like us to come with next time with the smash? Is it the strength training for smash? Is it, a, you know, like a whole maturation progression from you to the top level? Those are the things that make sense for everyone who is a scientist.
but also for everybody who is a coach. Anything from you, Harley? Yeah, well, yeah similar to Mark, I hope you kind of enjoyed the presentation and kind of makes you maybe question your coaching practice or hopefully helps it in some way. But yeah. Well, it was definitely a lot of information to take in. Many thanks, Dr. King, Mr. Towler, and Mr. Luskinov for sharing such an interesting discussion with us. It has been very enriching to talk to you and analyze the different topics that occur specifically in the badminton smash right now. And to our audience, please help us improve the quality of our program by completing anonymously the question that will appear on your screen. We encourage you to write to us and make proposals of topics you are interested in. Also, we invite you to check out Badminton Pan Am's YouTube channel where you can see this and other conferences we've held. Before we finish the session, we will connect with Juan Pablo, who will tell us the season five report. Please, Juan Pablo, it's your turn. Thank you, Richard. Joaquin, Stefan, and Harley for such an interesting webinar. Uh, on behalf of Mr. Germán Valdez, Chief Operating Officer, it's my true honor and privilege to quickly present an overview of what it has done this fifth season of the program, which started on, on July 6th and today is reaching to an end. Uh, we have seen a wide variety of topics that goes from the Olympic experience, uh, injury prevention, how to reach to the Olympics, uh, but also we have included some important research uh, webinars uh, that goes from the basic to, you know, uh, webinars which uh, stimulate good ideas and show scientific evidence like smashing fast and injury prevention and play impact of plyometric exercise, among other uh, areas. Regarding the attendees, uh, we have seen a um, good representation within the Pan-American country, 24 members association, John throughout the 12 webinars, but also we achieve an audience uh, or representatives from Europe, Africa, and Asia, which uh, uh, by adding all these 12 webinars, it uh, adds 380 participants on average from 17 countries and, and three continents. And interestingly, uh, we have achieved an audience of 380 I attend this at Zoom, but in YouTube, once the webinars are uploaded, the numbers increase significantly, reaching more than 2,000 views per in total. So uh, this is something very important. Uh, we hope that all these webinars stimulate good ideas, interesting discussions, and some thoughts. And you can watch those webinars in English, Spanish, or in French within our YouTube channel anytime or anywhere. Thanks to everyone watching us from the beginning, uh, but especially for those who has been constant since the beginning. Uh, it's very interesting for us to see you uh, Tuesday by Tuesday. And we hope and we look forward to having you uh, in our next season, which will start on November the 2nd. So thank you kindly for listening and see you soon. Back to you, Richard. Thank you, Juan Pablo. We greet all our audience that have accompanied us today, and in a special way, the following people. Stuart, Vladimir, Rene, Ilio, Raul, Gisela, um, Julia, Gladys, Ian, Sandy, Mikia, Halima, and Valanjahari. On behalf of Badminton Pan America Confederation, we thank you for your participation. Stay well and stay safe and see you in our next season.